Welcome everyone to the 19th AG2PI workshop. Um, the AG2PI, which is the Agricultural Genome to Phenome Initiative, is a USDA NIFA funded project to create a shared vision across crop and livestock communities. Um, I want to begin with an announcement just to let folks know that the workshop that had been scheduled for Friday um, has been postponed and we're currently going to be rescheduling that. I also want to let people know that the AG2PI conference, which will be June 15th and 16th in Kansas City, Missouri, um, is going to be accepting registrations through this Sunday. This will be a great opportunity to meet uh, everyone involved with this initiative, as well as all the folks who have been involved with the myriad of projects, including many of which that have been presented through this workshop series. Um, this workshop today is entitled The Water Dynamics uh, from Molecular Structure to Phenotype. This workshop will introduce how to utilize protein structure information and sequencing data to predict the hydration phenotype of different organisms. Our presenters today have been funded by the AG2PI initiative and really represents the interdisciplinary nature of the teams this initiative fosters. We have two first-year PhD students, uh, Benjamin Romajenko, um, who is uh, at the Botany Department at the University of Wyoming. We have Jose Ortez Soto, who's the first year at the City College of New York, also known as SUNY. We have two um, professors. The first is Marilyn Gunner, who's a physics professor at SUNY and a fellow of the American Physical Society, and Lena um, Godarno. Um, who's an associate research scientist at the University of Wyoming, working on plant and environment interactions. Uh, for this workshop, we're going to request that if you do have questions for each one of the presenters, please put them into chat. They will either be answered in chat by one of the presenters or addressed at the end of that section. We also want to encourage people to sort of think broadly in terms of, of converse, uh, questions that can lead to good conversations to really leverage this diversity of expertise in our, in our presenters today. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand it over to this team. Thank you, Eric, for the introduction. I think there was just one thing that was not quite right. That was instead of SUNY should be CUNY, right, Marilyn? <laughs> because it's the City College of New York. <laughs> So yeah. just wanted to clarify that before I share my screen. Okay, you guys see my screen? I guess you should be able to, right? Okay. Looks so, great. Uh, first of all, I wanna give a big shout out to the AG2PI community because this really uh, gave us the opportunity to start the transdisciplinary work as Eric mentioned with the, uh, with Marilyn Gunner in uh, New York. And actually today uh, we're gonna take you a little bit through our uh, larger picture of how we can utilize uh, water dynamics to go across scale. So please bear with us because there will be a lot of back and forth across scales. We're gonna do a lot of um, phenotyping talk, but then we're gonna dive in into more of the molecular work that our students have been uh, taking over during this past year. And then we're gonna circle back to actually show you how we could actually utilize water dynamics at the molecular level to implement our current phenotypic methods. So this is a little bit our workshop outline. And I'm gonna start immediately with the, a little bit of the background that led us to our hypothesis and how I at the beginning decided to reach out to Marilyn and see if we could work together. That was during the COVID time. So I actually never met Marilyn in person. So <laughs> this is a complete uh, online virtual collaboration for me. So as you all know, phenotyping, that is the quantification of some of the traits that we can measure from plants in order to know bigger and predict the behavior under uh, different environments has been um, really changing during the last years. Thank you to a lot of technological advances. Here in these pictures, you can see some of the instrumentation and facilities that we all have been using or some of you are very familiar with. Uh, with so you have a 
multi-spec handheld fluorometer. There are uh, there is an image from a thermal camera. Uh, there are then beautiful facilities that have a very large, uh, a very big uh, throughput where you can actually measure the entire canopy in a very short time, such as the one in Maricopa, the facility that they have in uh, in Nebraska. All of these phenotypic information have been really important to um, to increment the, the time of the measurements so that we can actually screen large population of plants in a very short time. This can actually has been really useful for any type of application starting from the agricultural one that we are the most interested in too, um, but also for forest work, ecosystem scale and breeding purposes. What at the same time has not um, has not have the, hasn't had the same pace is actually the um, hold on let's see if I can change yes uh, at the same time even if we have had such a great um, advances in the in the phenotyping methods we haven't really advanced in the way we look at the data and how we can actually learn from these more or less informative traits. So it looked to us that uh, many of us probably agree on this. Nowadays, we are still missing to actually collect very uh, informative traits. And here, I wanna show you this, um, if I can actually move my, okay, I think this would be better, okay. Um, here, I wanna show you this example of um, how hindered is still our productivity modeling right now. So even if we can collect a lot of data, we are still unable to actually predict uh, really well. So our predictive power for productivity and fitness is still not at its best. So here on the right, you can see that there are two different cubes that are representing the fitness landscape that we could actually predict from different uh, genotypes that are represented by these little stars on top at the bottom of these um, two cubes. The cubes are made up of different traits that we usually collect in phenotyping. So for instance, here we have the gross primary product productivity, root to shoot area, and some hydraulic information such as the vulnerability curves. Some of these traits are very time consuming to measure, but even if we substitute these methods, with the high throughput ones that I just showed you, right now is still pretty, um, our power for predicting the change from well water to water limiting condition and see how these genotypes or species can change their fitness over different condition um, is still not really predictive of what's gonna happen. So we started this, hypothesis thinking about a certain type of phenotyping that we still think um, is still not out there. What is an informed phenotyping? So we actually collect a variety of traits. And here in this cartoon, you can see really a lot of the ones that we measure basically every day. Um, but in reality, we need to decide, we need to actually uh, realize that some of these traits are not really predictive. They cannot help us into improving our models. That is actually what we wanna do at the larger scale. In order to have a predictive trait, a very important characteristic for it, it would be uh, actually making uh, having a trait that can be very easily scalable across scale of time and space, and also widely applicable so that it can be applied to different genotypes, different species. Uh, and even if you want to think a little bit in a larger scale, you can think of different organisms, even animals. So like we should start to use something that can be um, really informative of what are the basic principles of biophysics that you could apply to any type of organism. Of course, the high throughput and the easy to measure traits of the current phenotyping are really important, but we need to make sure that they go hand in hand with the information that we are getting from them. Otherwise, we don't push the models forward. Um, some example of classic phenotyping, many of you have been using some of this instrumentation. Uh, you can see some gas exchange, so infrared 
uh, gas analyzer to measure photosynthesis. We have a pressure bomb to measure water potential, uh, a thermal camera, a fluorimeter, a multi-spec that is a uh, integrated fluorimeter for also absorbance and other traits. But even when we just measure leaf area using some software like ImageJ or even more simpler than that, what I start really thinking about is that there is uh, something that connects all of these traits that we can measure. And what actually connects all of that is that in reality, what we are doing is to some extent looking at the water dynamics inside the plant. And I'm saying plant, but you will see by the end of this, this can be applied even to animals. And our community is actually really interested in something that can go across plants and animals. So I started to think that when I measure gas exchange, I'm actually looking at an exchange of water, right? I can measure some other conductance, how water vapor is exchanged through the leaves. When I measure water potential, it's nothing else that how the water is coming out of my stem or leaf or uh, any other part of the plant. Thermal uh, images also give us an idea of how water is moved throughout the leaf architecture, for instance. And then my attention was going much more over the years because that's one of my focuses, chlorophyll A fluorescence, how chlorophyll A fluorescence that I was measuring uh, through these fluorimeters um, was actually linked in some way much more than just um, a, a mechanistic link between the chlorophyll A fluorescence and the water dynamics. So water dynamics here, we just are um, thinking of that as the movement of water molecule throughout the body of a plant. This is how we started looking at it. So for some data that actually sort of reassured me that there was something much more than much more uh, than a simply disturbance of water to the signal of fluorescence. I'm going to walk you through some of our data during the last few years here in Wyoming. Um, so here on the left, you can see, uh, for instance, for the gas exchange measurements, we were having um, on the y-axis, you will see, uh, you see the leaf gas exchange for CO2. And uh, those are represented in green. And then you have in, um, in blue, the night respiration, leaf water potential infusion. And then in this little inset, you can see the somatal conductance. This was an experiment run on the species Brassica rapa, and we were following all of these traits over the time of drought. So everything seemed, of course, to be affected as we expected by the change in hydration of the leaves and the plant itself. But then we measure many other traits other than the gas exchange that is also very low throughput. So it's really time consuming uh, to, actually, uh, to actually measure. What we start looking uh, with particular attention was in effect fluorescence. Uh, fluorescence actually was we concluded from that study that was the most proximate trait um, to predict mortality. And in fact, in this other graph, you can see that uh, beyond just some different genotypes of Brassica rapa, but also with species coming from the field, such as different varieties of pinus, uh, we could actually um, we could actually see that fluorescence would decrease with a very nice um, with a very nice correlation with membrane leakage. So fluorescence signal itself is in some way mechanistically correlated to the the death of the cell. So we were going down to more of a cellular level at that point. Continuing on this, we actually also showed that chlorophyll A fluorescence was really robust, doesn't matter with what instrument we were measuring it. So we really utilized fluorometer with the, uh, the ones that are integrated with the LIGO system, we measure with the multi-spec, floor pen, floor cam, any of the different type of fluorescence and also different scales. And we were um, always getting this sort of relation with the water. And another important thing is that it was highly robust, this 
correlation was really robust across species, genotypes, uh, and time. So in this graph on the left, you can see that fluorescence was actually varying over the, um, the season for subalpine fare that we measure in the field. So even when you measure needles in the, in, the, in the field, you can see that there is this nice dynamic of fluorescence over the course of the year. So um, as you all know, during the winter, of course, the needles will be shut down and we have a low level, a low level of fluorescence, but then you will see the increase of water potential in this inset that will correspond to an increase of fluorescence back into the spring. Uh, we also did with different type, with different genotypes, looking at circadian variation. So how fluorescence changes over the time of the day. Uh, but also under different uh, water condition. And here on the right, you can see different Brassicarapa genotype in well water and mild drought condition, um, how their fluorescence as photosystem to efficiency was varying over time. As you can see, all the dotted lines are representing the plants that were droughted. And so all of them had the lower level of fluorescence. So at some point, I really became kind of obsessed with this idea of the water being really mechanistically linked to fluorescence. And so I started measuring pretty much anything I could from any species I was finding for our experiment. And you can see here, we did it with like stems of the Brassicaraba from flowers, from uh, different different pinus uh, from sagebrush, um, aspen, uh, so really different species that we were utilizing from both lab and field condition. And also fluorescence was always really robust in the response to water, um, even if you were measuring, uh, for instance, different organs, such as here, I did this short experiment here, like just on the um, on the, um, at the organ level of the one of the brassica, a turnip. So you can see that actually the turnip also gives you a very high level of fluorescence at the beginning, but then it will follow the dehydration level. So collecting all this data gave me the opportunity to think that we really needed to do something more to not only um, improve the way we measure fluorescence, but especially to mechanistically uh, learn more of how the water dynamics can affect fluorescence itself. Just to brush up a little bit of where fluorescence is coming for, from, uh, here we can see that there is a thylakoid, mem uh, there is a mem a thylakoid membrane. So our photosystem two is embedded in the chloroplast, of course. Uh, photosystem two is the site of photosynthesis, but especially uh, is also the site that we measure when we take fluorescence measurements. So fluorescence itself is the result of the energy partitioning coming off of photosystem two and partially photosystem one, but that's a different story that we can talk about another time. But basically everything I was measuring was especially coming off of photosystem two. So light is eating photosystem two, photosystem two is utilizing those electrons, but especially that um, this structure, uh, it's really embedded with water. So the water is utilized for photosynthesis, um, but, as, but the protein itself is embedded in some way with water. And so this led us to our main hypothesis. There was actually um, the water molecules have a mechanistic role in the response to the environment for plants. Here, please just be nice with me because this was a very naive way of looking at photosystem two structure. Uh, from top, you can see that photosystem two has in reality different type of waters that are attached to the structure. As every other protein, the pool of waters is divided between bound and unbound water that will have a different strength on the way, in the way they are attached to the protein itself. What is important here is that those water in some way maintain, help 
PS2 to be uh, structurally together in a way that chlorophyll A, the pigment, is embedded in the structure itself so that the head of chlorophyll A can receive continuous light. So all of this chlorophyll A here in green means that our plants, uh, that our chlorophyll A is active. In correspondently, I can actually measure a high level of fluorescence. And these are here on the top panel where we are at fully hydration for our photosystem too. Uh, if I lower the hydration level, I start seeing some of these um, unbound water that are represented in blue leaving our uh, structure. That means that there is a change in water potential all around my photosystem that leads this water uh, away from the structure itself. The chlorophyll A will be, uh, that I can measure at the leaf level at that point will be lower, but it will still be there. Uh, if I continue dehydrating my photosystem too, I can reach actually a level where my chlorophyll A is completely inactive. Why this is important? This is crucial because here is only representing that one for the system, but you need to think about at our measurement at the leaf or canopy level, we are actually measuring a population of photosystems. But if we nail down the process of one single photosystem level, then we can scale it up as much as we want because water dynamics can actually be um, scalable because they are basic, uh, based on those first principles of biophysics that I mentioned at the beginning. So the hypothesis that we wanted to test if these water dynamics are correlated to drought-resistant phenotype or drought-resistant species, and also if these um, different water dynamics could affect the fluorescence dynamic. So since I had this very naive way of looking at photosystem two, at that point I had to reach out to uh, somebody else that could help me at the molecular level. And that's actually how we started to work with the uh, lab in uh, New York. And so from now on, you we're gonna dig in into photosystem two and everything you will see will be related to this uh, to this protein here represented as like the larger super complex with the light harvesting um, complexes here on the side. And I'm going to give it to Ben for the next part. You mute yourself. Okay. Okay. And so, and so this is where we begin our, uh, where we kind of begin looking towards a sequence approach that may potentially address these challenges that look, or address our understanding of how water may move from the lumen to the oxygen evolving complex. And we know that this is done via water channels that, but we aren't entirely sure how this may vary across species. And so as a start, we figured we could start by going back to the physiology-based traits that we know and are comfortable with and developing essentially phenotypic bins, ones focused at, at the drought level, whether they're susceptible and tolerant. And in these bins, we needed to acknowledge that some of these varieties like cotton have variable um, species that are able to accommodate for drought or water, high water, high drought. But in this, we, we made these bins for a large number of plants, and we wanted to look at these across species, since that, that's uh, across species, 
and across the protein subunits of photosystem two. And so in our case, we looked at PSBO, which is um, a key protein subunit that is associated with water channels, but also known to be associated with the oxygen evolving complex. We also kept cyanobacteria in this pool of sequences as a way to um, have an outlier. And so our general workflow overview, some of you guys probably have re recognized a number of these sources like Uniprot, which is, contains um, protein data, sequence data, in addition to other stuff, and CBI, which also can have a number of protein data, but we use the COBALT program, which is used for sequence alignments, and then WebLogos, which also is a way to view our sequences and their alignments. Now, a number of these programs can be used interchangeably, function, and there is no correct one route or one data source or program, but this is what we found to be the most optimal for what we're trying to do, which is connect sequences to water potential variations or water susceptibility. And so here I'm going to start walking you through some of these programs that you may be familiar with. Share. And in our case, we used Photosystem 2. And so starting at Unipro, we want to search for a protein of interest. Sorry, Photosystem 2, subunit PSBO. And we can search for it. And in our case, we, we're interested in a number of things. So I said we wanted to keep our cyanobacteria present, which also has the PSBO subunit. And then we want a handful of plants, given our, our main analysis did a large number of plants and as many as we could collect, essentially through Uniprobe. And so right now we have spinach, we'll use garden pea, we use that as a structure later on. And we can also include potato. So five is enough for this example. And so we wanna download this as a FASTFA file. We can take a preview of it and we see how that's structured. You have your sequence identifier being a line of, and then you have your sequences following that. And then it's repeated for the next, which is spinach and the next. So we download that. And what we did in our case was we went to NCBI's COBOL and we uploaded it. And so again, we run this, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, and it gives us how the sequences are aligned. And so regions of gray are non-conserved regions, regions of white are just not present in some of the sequences, and regions of red are regions that the sequences are conserved between the organisms of this subunit. And so we can change this a number of different ways to look at um, freak differences, a number of different things like hydropathy, so whether the amino acids like water or not. But in our case, we can also look at the frequency-based differences. And so in the same section that we saw a lot of conservation, we can see in gray, there's the conservation of the amino acids as they're all the same across organisms. But we can also see the amino acid locations where the sequences are different. Light red being minor differences and dark red being larger differences. And so cobalt from the same place, you can 
take these sequences and have the output be a phylogenetic tree, which can be great for looking at essentially the evolutionary history of these organisms and these sequences. And we can see, as expected, T. volcanus is on its own branch evolutionarily compared to the higher plants, Arabidopsis, spinach, potato, and pea. And I'd like to note that in this case, we have something we, couple organisms that we carry through in structure are Arabidopsis and pea. Arabidopsis, we decided was drought tolerant and pea being drought susceptible. And we see that they are essentially on different branches, which is pretty good for indicating the, the orientations. Now, going back to our slides, we, what we did here was search for a protein and we downloaded it and uploaded it back to Cobalt. We saw the sequence alignments. And in the tree, although this is a slightly different look at it, we see that in smaller pools, the binnings are pretty good. But as we add more sequences or subunits, sorry, more subunits, so others than PSBO, as well as more organisms, so additional plants like maize or sunflower, we, we see that these bins don't align nearly as well. And so another thing we can do with these amino acids is look at how their frequencies are. And for this, we used um, a combination of Plessy Omega as well as um, Web Logo. And so here's just an example where we can see the amino acids in their lettering and their um, biochemical properties in the color. And in this example, there's areas of conservation as well as areas of difference between the biochemical properties. And so we can go back to the Clustial Omega program. And we can take that same FASTA sequence we got from Unipro, upload that, change the output format such that I'll read into web logos cleanly, and then we can submit it. And this will take a moment. Okay, so here's our output, and we see that where there's sequences, there, there are areas of alignment, where there are dashes, there, there is no analogous sequences, and at the bottoms, we can see these um, coatings, which indicate the proportion of um, alignments or relative counts. And so what this does is it puts out a data file, again, looks similar to the original one, that uses essentially takes the counts of each amino acids at each location. And we can download this. And we can go to web logos. And we can then insert that file. And we want to change a couple things, reading in amino acids make it so that it's not as um, squished and we can run this. And this is again, just kind of looking at the proportions of the amino acids and their properties. And we can see in this PSBO for the five organisms that there's quite a bit of conservation in here where there's only one single amino acid present, but also some regions where the amino acids differ in both, or differ in both the amino acid, but also the biochemical property. Here we have, I believe it's a Y and an F. 
And these changes might be important for the movement of water in, or these differences might be important for the movement of water through channels associated with PSBO. So again, here's the basic steps for looking via web logos. Take your FASFA sequence and run it into cluster omega, select the proper outputs, submit the job, and then download the output and read it into web logos. And again, here's a larger output of more sequences for our PSBO. And we can see again, there's quite a few areas of conservation, but also variations in the amino acids at locations that again, may be important for the movement of water through the protein. And so in this finding or in this work, we can again see large regions of conservation as well as those locations of amino acid variability. But again, liking to note that there really isn't one path for to do work on this sequence alignment as most of these websites all have the same functionality, but some are more user-friendly. And so some of the pros we found are, yeah, it's great for finding conservation areas, great for identifying the differences, and there's a lot of sequence data out there. We only used five, but I think we have a very large pool of over a thousand plants for some of the subunits. Some of the cons, none of this is innately spatially or structurally meaningful. And so, although we may have amino acid differences that we can see, we don't know whether that is actually touching where a channel may be or not. And so as a way to maybe address that structural um, question of, are these amino acids structurally important in a, in a structurally important location, we can, we move towards the, how, how can we address this structural look at water channels? And so what we did, we used RCSB's protein data bank, which has, contains a lot of structures of proteins, whether it's crystal, x-ray crystallography, or cryo-EM. And then we can read those structures into a program that I'm not sure if you guys are nearly as familiar with, Mole Online or Mole 2. And so Mole 2 has the ability to, once again, visualize structures kind of like RCSB, but you can also put in parameters to search for channels and pore spaces that um, fit your molecule of interest. And then when you search for those, Mole Online outputs a list of channels that are potentially fitting the lining residues of those channels and the channel properties. And so, we can return to RCSB and we can search for photosystem two and search for that. We can see that there's a lot of photosystem twos and, but because we're interested in say a higher plant, let's go ahead and search for um, the P photosystem two. And so note a number of things in this, we have a fair number of structures of photosystem two, but often there's some issues with the resolution. Ideally, we want a very low resolution or a high resolution structure, which means we want a low angstrom value. And so of the P structures, we have five XNML or five XNL. And from RCSB, we can look at the structure and we can see the photosystem two super complex like you've seen in a number of slides of mine. 
and we can see this PSBO. We can see a PSBO here. That's the sequences that we were looking at. And we can see the general area of the movement up toward, or we can see where a oxygen involving complex could be, but we don't really have the ability here to search for the channels of what that water could move through to get from the outside luminal space to the central oxygen involving complex. So what we do is we can take this four letter code, take it to mole online, which takes your RCSB and we can submit it. This can take a while. Hopefully the server isn't being bogged down. They call over the America. Ever since this old man just sent her. Okay, so once again, we can see our photo system too. There's also, because this reads in slightly different, we can see a lot of the heteroatoms like chlorophylls present in the structure, which although are interesting, in some cases it's visually impairing here. So we can go into our utility menu, click on the heteroatoms and we can hide them. And so again, let's orientate this a little better. We have our PSBO right here, but how do we find the water channels moving up to the oxygen involving complex? Well, we can go into this channels menu and search in under channel parameters where we have a number of things that you can adjust to specify for your molecule of interest of your protein. In our case, it's still water. And a number of these don't need to be changed, but in our case, we'd wanna change the bottleneck radius from 1.2 to 1.25, which allows us to search for the radius of water and then bottleneck tolerance we can leave B, which is the maximum length of the channel segment that's narrower than the bottleneck radius, in addition to the max tunnel similarity. So whether two channels will overlap and then throwing out the longer of the two channels as it would be redundant. And so we can submit this. So sometimes the channels pop up, but other times you have to go into the channels tab and highlight them, turn them on. And you can see in this case, there's a lot of places for water to be observed, but more often than not, we're not really interested in these auxiliary waters that are part of the more super complex. We we're interested in these channels near the PSBO and the other subunits that are associated with the oxygen involving complex. And so we can hide some of the other channels and looking at the central channel that may be of interest that goes to the oxygen involving complex. We can highlight it, it's currently purple. And we can see the list of lining residues for this channel. 
in the same manner, we can also see the radius of these channels as well as the length of these channels. And so again, still the purple highlighted channel, we can see that it's 51.3 angstroms long and varies between a radius of somewhere below four, somewhere between four and 2.5, it seems. But also we get an output of the channel properties. So both of these menus are currently for hydropathy so blue, hydrophilic, yellow, hydrophobic. But we can also select a number of different things like charge, ionizability, positive charge, negative charges, as well as polarities, mutabilities, and some things associated with lipids and solubility. So we can also look at polarity, things that might be important for the movement of water. So taking this back to our presentation, we can also use these, take these outputs across a number of different organisms for their photosystem two complexes. And we can see that between P, Arabidopsis, and the T volcanus cyanobacteria, we can see that their water channels do vary quite a bit around the oxygen involving complex in both structure, density, and path. And something, some things we decided about mole online too, or mole online was that it's really good to find a lot of places that water can fit physically. And it gives a good visualization of how channels could be different between organisms. And it's really easy to use. Some of the cons we find is that RCSB has a very limited amount of higher plant photosystem two structures, most of them being P or Arabidopsis and spinach, also at low resolution. Well, online also gives out the biochemical properties, but it doesn't really take into account the biophysical properties that whether water might actually want to be present in these locations. We also find that the export of data to then use in other systems like R can be quite complex and not very user-friendly or time efficient. And we also found that um, the water channels of T. volcanus, the outputs of mole, only align 33% with um, other published water channel data. And so that led to question, whether it was a good viable option for our use of searching for water channels. And so we wanted to do a little more validation of mole online to take into account some of the biochemical properties that for the placement of waters in these channels. So we, again, decided to collaborate with the Gunner Lab and try and use multi-conformational continuum electrostatics which will be addressed by Jose. Okay. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Oh, let me just share my screen real quick. Can everybody see my screen? Can everybody see? Yes, looks good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jose. Um, I'll be talking uh, about uh, how we use crystal structures to build the water channels um, using simulations. So a little recap. Um, Photosystem 2 is in the chloroplast. Um, it's part of the electron transport chain. And a byproduct of PS2 transporting electrons through the electron transport chain is that water is oxidized into molecular oxygen. Um, why are we interested in these water channels? Well, in a short span of time and seconds, hundreds of waters go into um, photosystem two. Um, the, cata the catalysis occurs and 
you get um, four hydrogens out and the molecular oxygen for every two waters that come in. Um, we are interested in how the water gets in and um, how these hydrogens leave. Um, as Ben mentioned before, uh, why are we not using mole two and instead of another? Uh, and, and why are we using mole two? And why are we not using mole two? And we're using a whole another program. Well, as Ben mentioned, um, uh, mole two is not very uh, good on reproducing data on published water channels. So we had to change strategies. Um, so how are we going to find these water channels? Um, we know that hydrogens move through water channels um, by hydrogen um, jumping, I mean, hydrogen hopping. And you can see from this image here that one hydrogen can jump from one water to another. They can also do this with residues um, in the water channels. So in the sequence, we want to look for residues that interact with um, these hydrogens, they carry hydrogen bonds, uh, and we want to identify them. You can see here that this uh, glutamic acid is interacting with this water, um, creating a hydrogen bond. So we want to look for residues that do that type of interaction. Um, the tool we're going to use is um, MCCE. Um, MCCE allows us, it was a code, first of all, developed by the Gunner Lab. Um, MCCE gives us an output on which um, residues are interacting in um, hydrogen bonds. They give us a hydrogen, a hydrogen bond network and helps us identify these channels. Um, there are three types of channels that have been identified in PS2. There's the broad channel, there's the narrow channel, and there's the large channel. Um, so how do we prepare these structures for um, um, to be analyzed in MCC? First thing we need to do is we need to download our structure from RCSB. Um, it's the 5XNL PDB file. And the next thing to do is um, uh, identify the area of interest. So um, PPS2 was um, frozen using cryo -EM. Um, When it was isolated, it was isolated with the light harvesting complexes. So we, that's a, not an area we're interested in. So that's the high, areas highlighted in red. We're not interested in these part of the structure. So we need to cut down the protein and use it and use the area um, in this square. Um, this, is the thing. this is the cut that we use and um, we submitted it into MTCE. Um, after that, um, we identified an area of interest in um, our protein complex um, that we knew that the water channels were um, located. Um, after the MCC analysis, um, we get a hydrogen bond network where we can visualize it using other programs like um, Cytoscape um, to see how everything is connected. And that's what the image you see on the, on the right is. Um, and I'll go into that, um, explain a little more right now. So um, visualizing this um, output from NCC inside Escape, um, we can identify residues of interest and see how they're connected to one another. Each square represents um, a residue, and each line to it represents a uh, uh, each line that comes out of each um, box is a hydrogen bond interact. It's a hydrogen bond interaction. We can see that this gets fairly complicated. We can see that everything is highly interconnected um, between the um, residues. And this image here, we see residues that are near the um, OEC, um, and uh, we can see how everything is um, interconnected. So after identifying identifying residues of interest and seeing how they're connected in the hydrogen bond network. The next step we did was um, to label them out in the 3D structure. Um, here we can see, um, oh, I forgot to mention, we can also here um, label each channel, um, each residue that belongs to certain channels by different colors. So that's also a, a way to visualize better the data. Um, after identifying the residues and which channels they do belong in, um, we, we went back to the 3D structure and labeled the residues 
um, that were in the hydrogen network with the relevant channels. And that's what you can see here. Um, the next thing we did is then um, from previous work done in the Gunner Lab, um, where uh, water channels in Thermos volcanis, which is uh, cyanobacteria, uh, were identified. We just overlaid them with this preliminary data from the pea plant, and we can see that um, the pea plant and the cyanobacteria are very um, highly conserved when compared to one another. Um, after um, this is very preliminary data, um, we when we ran these simulations, we didn't have waters inside the structure. So we know once we um, add more waters into the structure, there's going to be more connectivity between residues, and we're going to see a more complete um, hydrogen bond network inside this protein. Um, and this super complex, my bad. Um, so the ne next steps would be to add waters into um, these uh, this structure to see higher connectivity between residues. Um, as been mentioned before, we also want to look at different um, crystal structures of higher plants to find similar channels. And another thing we want to do is run simulations under different um, parameters, such as different pH levels and pressure. So I'll hand it off now to, um, oh, sorry. So if anybody is uh, interested into MCC and downloading it, we have a GitHub where you can um, get the software. Um, also the visual visualization of the hydrogen bond network is, um, we use a program called Cytoscape. It's free to download too. It's open to public. Um, and yeah, so I'll hand it off next to, um, Dr. Gunner, and she'll talk about the sequence differences between um, similar channels. All right. Um, good. Thank you. And so it's a pleasure to be here and to be, I guess, batting cleanup. Um, I want to kind of talk about what we're going, where we're going. So. Lena had this amazing vision to go from phenotypes to, you know, sequence to structures to understand things all, at all these different levels. And she and Ben have, and Jose have discussed uh, phenotypes, uh, sequences and structures. So how do we tie them together? And so what I want to show us is a little bit, again, preliminary, path to take the structure analysis to identify regions of the structure and then to look at the sequence variation. And then at the end, I'll come back a little bit to think about how we might bring the phenotyping back into this. So this is what Jose has shown us. The mesh is from Div Divyamata's work um, in the cyanobacteria. And this, the spheres are from the first, I think, first looking at at higher plant water channels, and they seem to be remarkably um, well conserved. And we'll see as we continue this whether that continues to be true. So these are these two PDB files that we're using. And um, what I want to do is just focus, as as Ben did, on um, PSBO, which is is here. Again, of course, you can do this on any um, any part of the protein that you would like. And and as I you know. As I'm told, we have, you know, people use are interested in, in all different kinds of organisms, animals, vegetables, no minerals, but we we do similar work in our lab on cytochrome C oxidase on complex one. So these are not, these tools are not limited to looking at plant proteins, but are, are useful for any proteins where water needs to get in or, or you know, water comes in and out or protons come in and out. Okay, so we're going to look at um, the sequence variability of the PBS, PSBO as an example. And so here it is just isolated from the rest of the protein. And um, this is the logos that we have. Again, I like this as a visualization tool. It's very, it pops out at me what's, what parts are conserved and what parts are changing. I did this by a somewhat different path than Ben did. I used I got the fastest sequence from the rcsb.org site. Um, I 
put this into blast P and use their multiple sequence alignment and output faster with gaps. And then web logos was, was able to read that. Um, but the problem is, you know, has been said, this is not connected to the structure and it doesn't highlight, you know, we don't know whether the regions that, that say Jose found as being part of the hydrogen bond network are in the regions that are variable or in the re regions that are conserved. So how are we going to do this? So these are residues that are in the hydrogen bond network that Jose showed us. And so this is um, what I'm going to look at. And what I want to do is look and see how, whether these particular residues are conserved. So you can see that they're not in next to each other in the sequence, here they are. And so I highlighted them. And what I want to do is look, separate these from the rest of the FASTA sequence and be able to look just at the conservation of a vector you know, con consisting of just these handful of residues. So we have a Python program, which I'd be happy, it's on, not quite ready for distribution, but we'd be happy to share it, where what we're gonna do is take here 100, res 100, um, 100 sequences and ask just for these few residues. We're gonna pull those strings out of the, the whole sequence, but pull the same, the, the sequence, the amino acid, which is aligned with, say, this glutamic acid or aligned with this aspartic acid, and see how those particular residues are conserved in all of these sequences. And what we find is, woohoo, you know, they're all like completely conserved. So that actually is good on one hand because it says, well, Jose and MCCE and Ben found residues that are likely to be important because they're highly conserved. We, we have that, that feeling that things that are conserved. But it's not going to help us with the idea of, well, whether these there are things which will have to do with, with drought tolerance or, or not. So what I'm going to do now is look at the region around the protein, be, around these, because what I'm going to need for the protons to move through this channel is I'm going to need waters that are going to connect these amino acids to these amino acids. I'm going to need... Um, and so if I have residues that come in between and perhaps block the water channel transiently, that might make it easier or harder for protons to move down through here. If I have residues that become more, have a different or more positive, it might repel protons from these regions, blocking proton transfer out. More negative, it might be happier to come into this region. So it really, we want to see not just, now that we've seen that the direct residues are really highly conserved, what about the regions around them? And so I put this into PyMol and I use this command where I, the underline is just a name that I gave it. It says, um, you know, create a, a, a group of residues that just are all the residues within 10 angstroms of one of the amino acids that Jose identified in his network. And here they are. And so now I'm going to put these, just these into web logos. And I see that this is, you know, more promising for what we want to do, which is to find differences that um, that that come back to the phenotype. So we see that again, some portions are highly conserved, but there are regions right around this important, what we believe is a functional part of the protein that are um, varying from from between different sequences. And so, you know, so in conclusion, I mean, we've looked at the sequence conservation, we've looked at uh, structure analysis, and now we're seeing how to bring these together. And the hope is to um, take the phenotypes so that such that Ben actually began to show us how we were binning, um, making a, a group of, of, um, of organisms which are drought tolerant and organisms which are not. And what we want to do is see whether those um, changes in the sequence actually come back to these regions, which are, we believe are going to be important for uh, the water channels and for proton transfer out of the protein. And so in the next phase is to really have, you know, a, a much bigger list of sequences which are dry, tolerant, or sensitive. 
and identify the regions in the PS2 sequences that are that are um, connected to their dry or wet tolerance. And then what we will do is ask are these residues in these water channels? I mean, now we know where, where we think the water channels are. Um, it's pretty straightforward. If you have a, st a, a structure and a few residues that are different to ask a number of programs to um, remake your, your structure for you with these mutations, and that's pretty easy. Um, we will, of course, run full analysis of some of them. If we have a thousand, we're not going to run a thousand. We'll maybe do a thousand here and 10 here. Um, so in you know conclusion for what is easy and hard, um, you know, see, there are tools that are really great that are free and are really straightforward for people to use. And I, you know, and I and I really have to thank the the people who make these websites. They are really not easy to do. And I mean, it's the sequence alignment, Clustal, Blast, you know, and CBI, they do. They're great, and so that's great. Mall two is a beautiful interface, and. I mean, right now we're a little skeptical of it because of our trying to benchmark it, but I would say it, it might be worth playing around with it because it is it is easy, but just, you know, ha look at it with, you know, with what you know about your sequence, about your structure. Um, you know, I mean, obviously looking at structure files to me is, is straightforward and I think it's well worth doing. These things of tracing the hydrogen bond paths, um, is actually right now I think still requires more complex programs. Um, MCCE is here. Um, there's a program which I, I have to admit I haven't used, but my friend Nic Nicoletta Bondar has um, done, put a lot of effort into making this um, reasonably user friendly. Again, it starts at GitHub, so I think it's probably not you know absolutely plug maybe plug and play, but you've got to plug. And so um, you know. I think there's these and these um, can be done on our protein, but can be done on your protein as well. Okay, Lena, I think back to you. Okay, I think I'm gonna wrap it up and take it back to the phenotyping at the larger scale with some take some points and some of the products that we're gonna have from this seed grant from the AG2BI community. So first of all, I just wanna say once again, thank you to the AG2BI because it really gave us the opportunity to work on uh, this type of interdisciplinary uh, um, flow that was kind of hard at the beginning because of the lack of some um, unique platform. But to give you some of the takes on what we have learned so far is that water dynamics can actually be um, one of those highly predictive traits, because if you think about its uh, a scale invariant property, they can be easily scaled up and down uh, since we, it's actually based on principle of biophysics. So the water dynamics we have seen that um, can vary and it can be informative of different genotypes. We have given you some example of how different those water channel and so the uh, amino acidic lining. You are not seeing the slides? Let me just stop for a second because you are not seen the slides looks like can you see it now okay so too many windows i guess all right sorry so it's our highly predictive trait and we have seen that can be informative of different characteristics of species in terms of drought tolerance um, this type of scale invariant property can actually improve our understanding of genome to phenome. And we have tried to give you some example today when we went from like the sequences all the way to uh, the, the structure and then Marilyn tried to circle back to what the 
phenotype would be. Um, an example of one of these predictive traits just with, uh, as water dynamics, we can actually link that back to the type of methods that we use already in phenotypings. And so for instance, if you think of where we started today at the level of photosystem two, you will have an entire population of photosystem two at the level of the thylakoid membranes in a leaf, in a canopy. And so water dynamics can really improve and give us what we aspicate being an informed phenotyping going from the cellular level uh, up to the global scale. And some of the way of measuring um, one way to measure those water dynamics can actually be represented by chlorophyll A fluorescence methods, because as I showed you at the very beginning, there is a direct uh, correlation between the amount of water passing through photosystem two and the chlorophyll A that we measure, as you see here, for, uh, from a leaf. Uh, so fluorescence can actually be a real mean of informed phenotyping. And this is highly important for us because it can really improve and push forward the productivity and mortality prediction. So that initial uh, fitness landscape that I said right now, it's impossible to compare under different environmental condition or for unknown genotypes. If we find these good predictive traits, just as water dynamics can actually improve our prediction and our predictive power for productivity. And I'm currently actually working on some of these as you uh, can see in this graph on the right. So there are already existing uh, models such as the three model that we are utilizing right now that is a whole plant productivity model and what we can do is actually um, forecast what is the productivity of different species. And the model itself has already been tested uh, across different species. So far, though, the model was not using changes um, in chlorophyll A fluorescence, but was using a static way of measuring fluorescence. So using always the same value across, uh, across time. What we are doing right now is actually changing between the base model here represented with the open circle and what we call the beta for the system two model, then actually looks at dynamic and utilize the dynamic of the system two under different uh, environmental condition. As you can see on a one-on-one -on -one line between the model assimilation rate and the observed assimilation rate, when we start using the model um, with the with the solid uh, symbol, you can see that the model that utilizes chlorophyll fluorescence actually implements our prediction of productivity. So this is a first step towards um, a, better, uh, a better modeling for productivity and mortality. And then just as Marilyn already mentioned, uh, for all of you that have been watching this video, we'll watch it later. Um, what our work really wanted to give you is sort of a pipeline and how to go across different software and platform, um, trying to model in from the sequences through the uh, crystal structure and make connection with the actual phenotype that we measure. But this is not something that we can only do with Photosystem 2, but uh, all uh, the pipeline and all the website that you have seen that can be applied to any protein and actually very interesting to any organism. So we really need to push our community towards a unified type of pipelines that we can all try to utilize. And this is one of the reasons why I'm the most grateful to this community to give us this opportunity to start working on this. So since our cross-disciplinary work was um, was only one year long and, it were, and we really started to have uh, these results almost halfway through the, to the funding. We still don't have public uh, data set available, but these are the products that are gonna be posted on the AG2PI website, all the links to the data sets that will be related to Photosystem 2, sequences and water channel simulation, of course, but also a workflow that will go through just as in this presentation, how you can go from sequences to the, to the actual crystal structure and back to some of those uh, sequences 
or phenotype. We are planning to have a manuscript on what Jose started showing you, uh, so the differences and similarities between cyanobacteria and dyer plants in water channel. There seems to be something that uh, is still not out there. And then hopefully we'll have another manuscript where we gonna focus on the characterization, phenotypic characterization from the sequence and channel differences. So really get back to the phenotype picture of how plants are more or less drought tolerant. Uh, and hopefully if Marilyn is still, <laughs> The, is still there to support me through another uh, grant. We'll see if we can actually write another uh, cross-disciplinary proposal. And in this case, we are actually been uh, chatting about uh, pulling in some other collaborators that could actually work with the new organism that we haven't uh, worked, uh, worked yet. And actually focusing a little bit more, I would be really happy to look uh, more at an angle that pulls in more of the phylogenetic and the evolutionary history uh, of this water channel. And as I said, all of this will be posted along with this video on the AG2BI website. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are questions. If anyone has questions, um, feel free to to type them in chat. Um, or I, if you're okay with it, Lena and everyone else, I think maybe just unmute and and ask a question. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Not sure if everyone's being shy or <laughs> if you sufficiently yeah, answered everything. Um, yeah, we overwhelmed them quite <laughs> enough. <laughs> and I guess that would be the that would be the emails of all of us as well. So they can actually just send us email with question if needed be. I have a question about in terms of uh drought stress measurements so what so I, I think based on my understanding you want to kind of like try to uh, correlate you know the photosystem 2 or chlorophyll a out of uh, fluorescence to uh, water dynamics uh, but in order to kind of like addressing I guess the different like drought stress like like there are people who like, you know, like I saw that you use kind of days after stop watering as the measurement for uh, drought. But there, again, I, I, I don't know if there's a more specific um, measurement, like pe some people use like soil water content, or is there a more quantitative measurement for like plants going through drought? Because maybe like just the drought, like the days after stop watering, it may not translate to the same, like, you know, like hydraulic, you know, pressure or anything for different plants. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And in our lab, actually, we do utilize a uh, variety of methods to look at how the plants will actually be droughted over time. So the way I represented it was just to give you an idea of how that progressed. But of course, we monitor the soil, the volumetric soil water content. We also have other means such as looking at the impedance at the leaf level. Uh, we calculate relative water content over time. So that was more of a way to represent it in a easier visual, but definitely um, the days, of course, are not relevant, especially when you start looking at across species or genotypes, because if you stop watering at day uh, four, for instance, that will, uh, will signify something completely different for one species versus the other. So we are actually 
utilizing different methods that are more um, uh, more fit to actually express drought tolerance. So among those parameters, like which ones you see, I guess, a high correlation to the chlorophyll autoreference? So one, for instance, that I, I showed already is like the, the leakage, but then another one that is really goes yeah. hand in hand with fluorescence. It's also the um, impedance. So that would be uh, sort of the resistance is a means of resistance in the tissue. And so you will be seeing an increase of resistance in a tissue because you will see less water. And so those uh, other solute and the uh, carbon itself will be, um, will be put in uh, the water, the, the electricity that we use in the microneedle would actually uh, need a more, more work to pass through the same tissue. Yeah. So impedance and uh, leakage are the two that I think, at least in my hypothesis, are the closest, the most proximate to what fluorescence measure itself. And so they are the most informative for drought. And does these highly correlate with, you know, the biomass or like seed yield at the end? Yes, absolutely. So when you have like a, in every type of like drought experiment that you will have, drought will be affecting, of course, your final yield. And, uh, and you see that there is correlation there. So the difference is that we really try to find what is the trade that might be the most predictive. And so it's like the most useful ones. I feel that like fluorescence can be a good one because it doesn't just crash at the very end, but it has right. more of a linear change over time with the drought progression. And we are talking about drought, but in reality, this can be applied to any type of stress. Because if you think about water, in some yeah. way it is related to any other type of stress because if you increase the temperature, your water molecule will move faster. If you freeze your sample, your water molecule will be stuck, right? So you are actually more than water dynamics. What you really need to think about is water potential that you can mm -hmm. really change with different type of environmental changes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. I I don't know if there is a question on in the message. I mean, practical ways to use chlorophyll A fluorescence to determine drought stress, example, drought stress levels in a farming system, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I. I think, I don't know if I understand practical, <laughs> what is like practical in terms of like the throughput, like what would be the best method? Uh, if you, for instance, have, uh, I think I need a, a little bit of more clarification on the question itself. I don't know if Matthew, you can unmute yourself probably to help me understand your question better. All right, so I was thinking like in a farming system, for example, like crop crop production, planting your crops, you want to ascertain the drought, drought uh, stress level. So I'm a farmer, for example, how am I going to use this knowledge to, you know, Oh, about how to apply the knowledge, the yes, knowledge exactly. when in a farming okay. system. Mm. Yeah, now it's clear. Thank you. Um, so for instance, one great application of all these studies, the way I'm envisioning it, it would actually be in water management itself. So let's say if you have like, if you are in agriculture, you have fields or you are interested in how to manage or uh, save water for uh, watering a field, what you can think about, it could actually be monitor one means of drought stress, such as can be chlorophyll A fluorescence. And nowadays, as I showed some of those very portable uh, instrumentation, some of them can actually be, uh, they are 
pretty cheap to buy. And you can even like share data uh, like with other farms. There are actually projects online that are trying to do that. So um, what you can do is utilize chlorophyll A fluorescence um, as a monitor that will actually predict how you can use your water, right? So as soon as you change, as soon as you can see change in the fluorescence dynamic uh, of your plants, that would actually be indicative of when you need to make changes to your water management. And to some extent, even find how much you can stress your plants before um, they actually are really affected, right? So if you remember, I showed that hydration level and fluorescence, if you are in the middle, there is a recoverable time for your plants. So you could actually use less water for your field and still gain the same type of final yield, if this answer your question. I hope it does. <laughs> Then there is another question in the chat. Um, what's the field scale measurement device for chlorophyll A fluorescence? Will the CIF imaging be feasible for this drought stress study? So that's a great question. So uh, chlorophyll A fluorescence for the instrument that I showed you as like the PAM, the pulse uh, amplitude modulated system, is not really um, applied right now to field work just because you need saturating pulses that are really expensive to make for machinery in the field. But what is important is that the fluorescence itself and the connection to water dynamics, they would actually stay exactly the same as we have showed you for the chlorophyll A fluorescence to any other type of fluorescence that you would receive in and around photosystem too. So see if actually would be feasible at the global scale even for this type of drought stress because the water will have the same influence uh, biophysically that it does on the chlorophyll A fluorescence. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I have another question about, so I think we have been mostly talk about like drought stress. What about like overwatering in terms of like, you know, like water logging? Do you see the same correlation with the chlorophyll A autofluorescence when it's kind of like water logging stress? So the dynamics of chlorophyll A fluorescence, they, and not only in our studies, like there are uh, a lot of studies out there, they actually really, uh, the dynamic can correlate with any type of stress. So it, what it really is, it's a way to measure the efficiency of your photosystem too. And if you are either underwatering or overwatering your plant, you are actually giving too much water or too little water to your photosystem too. So as I mentioned before, if you have different types of um, different types of stress that you can think about, they actually, in many different ways, will affect photosystem too eventually, and you will have a response in fluorescence. For the uh, flooding, for instance, what you have is a delayed fluorescence response, but you still see a response. So the dynamic is always something that um, will, will be affected by changing the watering. Do we have any further questions? Um, again, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, um, or if you prefer, you can type it into chat. So I, I'm just gonna keep asking. <laughs> so That's I great. guess. Thank you, actually. 
I guess in terms of you know changing in water uh, potential, like what's the changes on like the molecular level? Like is the interacting like between hydrogen bonding or are there actually also maybe conformational changes of the water channel in the you know um, the thylakoid membrane? So I can answer half of it. So up to like <laughs> up to like the cellular telagon membrane, and then I leave it to Merlin and Jose that will give like more of an idea of that. But conceptually, yes, when you change water potential, you are basically either pushing in or taking out like waters from your system to some extent. And then of course will affect those polarity and every uh, and will actually have some conformational change at the end that Marilyn can really tell you much more about. <laughs> yeah, this is, I mean, this is uh, interesting and, and challenging to, to model because I don't, haven't found people who were doing water uh, pressure in simulation methods. So we have some ideas about how to do it. But the fact is, is that we would, there are certainly water positions in the channels where water is more tightly bound and others where they're less tightly bound. And if water is pulled out because the water potential, because of drought and waters begin to leave photosystem two, for example, that will certainly lead to changes in the structure. And so to, to do this, you need to model it. Even in standard wild type uh, photosystem two, we see that the water chains are broken. If we've, we've run molecular dynamics and looked at the water connect, the, the hydrogen bond connectivity in molecular dynamics, that gives us a feeling of the dynamics. And what we find is that some of the, you know, we see breaks in the chain and we see, and that would mean that it would be very impossible to get a proton out that channel for that instant. And so we're, I'm hoping, expecting that some of those breaks will be, um, perhaps it will be harder to make those breaks in water, in, in drought tolerant um, proteins than in, than in not. So that would protect them from, or that the, or that the water might be more tightly bound in drought tolerant plants than not. But this is something we don't know yet. Yeah, that's true. So I'm just wondering, could there be, you know, like maybe hydrogen bonding or some other types of bonding form between, you know, the water and the proteins of the um, water channel? And, you know, when the plant's going through drought, it may cause this conformational change of that channel that right i would agree with you 100 percent. that that exact i would say exactly the same okay but it, it it just need more data and more modeling to actually test that okay. yeah we have it in our heads now we have to get it you know find some way to, to yeah to, and and that's you know it's 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 yes but that's i think the the flaw the, that's the model that we all have in our heads and i i do as well as you okay <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then the okay. last thing we are, we're going from from atomic level intuition to you know to full plant intuition and we we have we have you know connected intuition so i think that this is what we're supposed to be doing yes and then Thank it goes you. yeah it goes back uh like to the way we measure it like at the leaf level right because you should think about like a population of photosystem two and then you have a population of leaves and that's why we talk about the scalability of this type of approach we we also want to point out that i mean lena has come to think about photosystem two largely because of the, the this is the proximate cause of the fluorescence but obviously there are many other you know, the electron transfer chain can change its dynamics and that changes the, the non-photochemical quenching that occurs. You know, we, we have many other, you know, many other things that can be important for how, how plants deal with, with, with um, water stress. And, you know, so I think we're not, we're looking at this as a pilot to say, okay, we can, 
go from the 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 you know phenotype to the you know to separate the genes we can see which part of the proteins are important and see if they correlate but if they don't you know there's no reason that we can't say hop to another protein and say let's look at where we see the genetic changes the, the sequence changes that correlate with dry and wet and then come back and look at the the those those proteins look at those um, sequences, those structures. So this is, you know, I think we're not, you know, we, we both love Photosystem 2 and we'd love it to be in Photosystem 2 and we're working very hard, but but it's not the, the methods that we're doing. And, and we, we've both talked about this, that these methods will, you know, we can move them around now that we're developed, as we develop them, they, you know, now that we know how to do it on one protein, we can do it on another if that turns out to be more likely to be a, a good um, place where drought stress is being modulated by different protein isoforms. Any final questions or, or comments? Yes. Thank you, everyone, again, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. OK. All right. Thanks, everyone. And yeah, I guess we'll um, we'll take back another 20 minutes, right? Add that back into our lives here. <laughs> um, and, uh, again, the recording will be available, um, probably later today. Um, and if you're still on, please fill out the survey when you exit the, um, workshop, um, and I'll provide that feedback back to our presenters. So thank you everyone for attending today and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>